I want to read Galatians 4, the first seven verses. He says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. I just want to speak to you a few minutes on this thought, the adoption of sons. The adoption of sons. Father, we ask for your anointing upon the reading, teaching, and hearing of the word of God. Lord, we thank you for the spirit of adoption. Lord, we thank you tonight for this great redemption. Lord, that you brought us out of a lost family into your great family. Father, we thank you for a price paid. Lord, thank you for the life of Jesus laid down. And God, we thank you for your spirit that you have sent to abide within us here tonight. Lord, thank you for the way you've moved in this house, Lord. Nothing greater than your presence. What an encouragement you are. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. The adoption of sons. Truly all throughout the book of Galatians, it is a corrective letter. He's dealing with an issue. Anybody know the church had issues? Sometimes, sometimes they do, but one of the great encouragements that I've seen is I've seen preachers that were ashamed to be around certain people or this and have this person or that person in their church because they had problems or Maybe their doctrine or their life wasn't right, but man, when you read the letters of Paul, just about every church he ever planted had problems. You know why? Because they're filled with people and people have problems. And you just have to know as whatever ministry that you have, God's not sending you into a place that's perfect and otherwise there'd be no need for you to be there, right? Right. So he sends you into a place that's dark and hard and difficult because in Christ, you have the answer, right? You, you bring the word. You're, you're there to teach. You're there to be patient and long-suffering with people and not, not to give up on them. And so Paul is corrective in this letter and not just telling them that they're wrong, but explaining to them why. You know, we, we have to teach the word. We have to teach people. Sometimes sit with people where they are and explain it to them. Sometimes you have to explain it to them again and again and again because we learn slow, don't we? Um, and so that's what he's doing. He's explaining how grace, which is God doing it, is better than law, which is you doing it, right? He's explaining the, the, how your life under grace is so much better than the life under law. And the purpose of the law, the law always tells you try, 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 try again. But it always proves to you the same thing. You can't do it on your own. And it's something in our flesh that's just like, God, give me one more chance. But really, God has been bringing you to that place where you would give up on yourself and you would admit to him and confess with him that there's nothing good in me. I can't please you. And, and, even, and in that is a broken condition, but that's where God has been trying to get you all along because if you think you can do it on your own, you don't need Jesus. You don't need Christ. But in that broken state, you, you come and in Christ you're not under the law, which means you're not here to live for God by your performance. I had a good job, a day today and I didn't uh, yell at anybody on my job, so that's why God moved in the altar. But we might be tempted to think, well, I had a bad day today and me and my wife got into it this morning, so I just know it ain't going to be a good night at church. And if you're, you're in that, you, you're living your life 
under the law of your performance. And you'll come to God when you feel good, but you shy away when you, when you don't. And your life is just up and down. God is wanting to bring you to this place of grace where grace actually means a gift. You didn't do anything to deserve. While we were yet sinners, everybody say sinners. Christ died for the ungodly. That is God's grace. When we were dead in our trespasses and in sin, God, who is rich in mercy and great in love, He quickened us. He gave us life, not because we did anything, but because Christ did it on our behalf. And when you got saved, you didn't have anything to offer God. Man, I just had a mess. And, and I, I couldn't do anything. I tried to fix it. I tried to do it better. But every time I tried, I just made it worse. Anybody ever been? So you bring the, the guilt and the shame and the filth. You bring it to Christ and He gives you a new life and forgiveness. He gives you righteousness. And from your heart ought to just abound. Thank you, Jesus. God wants you to get saved and never get over it. Amen. Every day, just a day of thanksgiving, you know. I've just felt that, man. I've been covered in oil and laying in the mud, Brother Tim. And just, I don't know where. Hold my mule. I just need to shout a little while. I'm just remembering where I was. I thank God my life and my joy is not bound in a broke down tractor. But it's in Christ who will never be broken down. And He's the same whether I'm having a good day or a bad day. I know I will make it through because His grace gives me the strength to continue to press on. He says in verse 1 that an heir, as long as he's a child, he's no different than a servant, even though he is Lord of all. So he possesses everything. Everything belongs to him. But as long as he is a child, a child here, it speaks of an infant or a little child, one who is childish or untaught or unskilled. Uh, they, they don't know. They can't speak. They can't make decisions. That's where the law keeps people. That's why God gave the law because they got a, 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 a broken mind and a, and a, and a, and a sinful heart. So God just uses the law as a restraint. But that's not where we, they were created to live. God wanted them to live in relationship with Him. But the law was just a, a tutor and a governor to bring them to the place that they would accept Christ. An heir here, it, it means one who receives. One who receives an inheritance. Anybody ever inherited anything in here? <laughs> not too many. Um, you know, in, in an inheritance, you didn't do anything to earn that. Somebody else leaves that to you. Well, the Bible says that the, the heir, as long as he is a child, as long as he's in this infant state, it also means one that is childish or untaught, unskilled. He, he doesn't know. Even though he's Lord of all, he's no different than a servant. A servant is a, a slave. A servant is one who is not free. He's no different. It, it's like this. It's, it's like having, the, having something but not possessing it. It's like you have the promise but you're not walking in it. You think about how many people, maybe, maybe they're Christians. Maybe they do believe in you know, the finished work of Christ, His death, His burial, His resurrection. But they don't know how to live their daily life receiving the grace of God by the same faith that brought them in. And they're out here just trying to do something that would please God and make them acceptable in His sight. They're no different than a slave. It simply means they're not enjoying the benefits of, you know, just fellowship with God or the, the power of the Holy Spirit or the joy of the Lord. Why? Because they're so bound in their own efforts that they're not receiving the inheritance. They're not receiving what Christ has done. It's like Israel being in the wilderness. Come on, go with me. Follow me. And I'm going to take you to a land flowing with milk and honey. You're going to live in houses you didn't build. You're going to pick from vineyards you didn't plant. And, and all this, I'm going to give it to you. Well, they've got the promise. But because they did not allow, they did not believe God to cross over that Jordan. 
They went up there and instead of seeing the grapes and the pomegranates and the great land flowing with milk and honey, just think of that for a moment. I was reading something about that this week. They said that there were so many bees in that land that the trees couldn't contain the honey and it would just pour out of the trees, Brother Robert. It would fall all over the ground. That's where God was taking them to. It was filled with livestock. That's where they were going to get that milk for all of that. But instead, all I saw was a giant. All I saw was a problem. Think about how many people are paralyzed. Think about how many people ought to have been here tonight and just received that good, deep drink of living water, but instead let a giant standing in their way keep them, you know, wallowing in their problems. Wallow. You know, even though you might be an heir of eternal life in the kingdom of God, you're no different than a servant because that is... Your, your faith is not allowing you to walk in access all that God has for you. It says even though He's Lord of all, the Lord means one to whom something belongs to, the one who has power and possession of a thing. Even though all that's going to be His, He's got no access to it. It's an issue of maturity, you know. One day, everything I have will belong to Carter and Logan and Hannah, but there's some things I'm not going to give them tonight, right? It's like I asked Audrey, she drive herself here. She said, no, I wish. <laughs> One day she'll be driving, probably driving that Camry around, reckon? Just not today, right? It's an issue of maturity. So God does have to take us to a place of Maturity. How many of you look back over your life, things you were praying for and wondering why God wouldn't give it to you? And you look back now that you got a few gray hairs and a little more years under your belt. And I wasn't ready for that. I remember one day at the community center, Brother Roberts, about 60 folks come. I don't know where they come from. I never seen them before and I ain't seen them since. <laughs> Fear gripped my heart. I walked outside, I remember walking on the sidewalk, weeping, saying, God, don't let this thing outgrow me. And what I meant was a church full of people, but a, a man that's not yet ready to lead them. So we got all these folks and all this stuff, but we got no depth, we've got no maturity. God answered that prayer, they all left the next time. <laughs> It's an issue of maturity. God, do it in my life. I, want to, I don't want to just talk about your promise. I don't want to just talk about what you can do. I want to experience that. I want to live that. Listen, verse 2, he says, But they are under tutors and governors until the time appointed by the Father. I studied this in this day and time. Jewish children, also Roman and Greek children, they were they were. Up until the age of some teenage, some, most of them were teenagers, up until that time, there were hired servants that lived in the house. They were very trusted, very faithful, very dependable servants. And it was their job to look after the children. I, I guess mom and dad worked or you know, went on, but it was the job of the servant to watch over that child. And you think even though this child is the heir of the house, Meaning all things belong to him. He's not allowed to make his own decisions. He's not allowed to go outside. He's not allowed to speak for himself, order his own food, pick out his own clothes. Somebody is doing that for him. So he's no different than the servant. He doesn't have freedom. He doesn't have the liberty. He doesn't have the power to choose. Why? Because in the eyes of the father... He's not ready yet, right? He, we can't depend on him to make his own decisions. So someone else is going to make his decision for him. That's really the, 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 the sentence of the law. That's really the power of the law. It is meant until, until you come to Christ and you receive a new mind, a new heart, and the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, the law is meant to weigh upon men's conscience to tell you that 
is wrong. This is right. You're wrong. You're not holy. Don't do that. Don't go there. All of these things, that is what the law was meant to do. So they're under tutors. The, the tutor is one who has the care or the tutelage of children, either where the father is dead, as in a guardian, or even when the father is still alive. A governor there means the manager of household affairs, a steward, a superintendent, sometimes a slave, other times a free man who is the head of the house and entrusted with the management of the affairs, the care of his children, and every uh, the, the dealing out the proper portion to every servant and the children who were not yet of age. So the law acts in that way. You, you've got no freedom. It's a restrainer. It's there because uh, there's, a lack of, there's a lack of maturity. There's a lack of understanding. So he says in verse 3, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. So when we, this is whether we were a literal child or just someone without spiritual understanding. I try to do my own thinking a lot. Sometimes I still do, and it proves the same thing. I can't do it on my own. Sometimes I'm hard-headed, and I beat my head against the wall trying to make a way until God reduces me down to Help me. So whether it's a literal child or someone without spiritual understanding, he says they are under, they are in bondage under the elements of the world. The word bondage means to reduce to slavery. Now the elements of the world, this is interesting. It, it actually means any human structure that's not God's plan. It, it just means the structure of the world. It can be the structure of religion. You think about these Jewish boys growing up under Judaism. Imagine how strict that would be and all the things you can do, you can't do. Imagine that, that Nazarite. Candace preached about uh, Samuel a few weeks ago who was a Nazarite. There were so many things they couldn't uh, eat uh, grapes or drink grape juice, wine. They couldn't cut their hair. They couldn't go near or touch a dead body. So uh, all, uh, so many things, they, they were under that. You, you can be under the elements of men, just, just the way that men do things, under that structure, under that pressure, under that influence. You can be under the elements of your family. You know, most families do have structure. This is what we do. This is my dad. Every time I'd go out when I was a teenager, he'd tell me a few things one of them would be don't come back with no tattoos he'd tell me no earrings no tattoos you just can't you can do it, get away with a lot of things in our family but you better not do that all right so uh you know and and so families have structure families have you know some there's pressure there to go to college some there's pressure here to go into this business or that or marry this person or go you know all sorts of things you're under the elements of the world and this is it you will worship something. You will worship something. Even people that say, well, I don't believe in God. You do worship something. You, you will be under something. Something will rule you. Something will control you. It can be law. It, it can, it, you know, in this way of trying to please God. And that's just weighing on you. Making your life miserable. And it's affecting the way uh, you live. The way you treat other people. You know, you probably, if you're living that way, you're probably a Pharisee. And people don't want to be around you. Because you just have a very religious persona. You'll be ruled by sin just and it can take any form any fashion it can be something dirty and nasty that everybody knows is wrong or it can be something that you keep locked up in your heart it can be you got a tongue so long you can lick the pots in the kitchen from the living room even that it doesn't matter you will be ruled by something you'll be ruled by the world people are eat up with you know entertainment knowing which celebrity is dating this celebrity Celebrity and so on and so forth. I, I was talking to a man today. Can you imagine when this is over? You live life the way you did. You pursued what you want to pursue. And when it's all over and you're out of time, you're standing before this God 
and you've done nothing to prepare. And it's final. And it's over. And you're about to meet your ultimate end. You will worship something. People worship money. If I can just get this, if I can just get there, if I can just drive that, if I can just live there, if I can just go with him, go with her. People worship other people. Living under. I just want to make them, man, that can be the worst thing of all, right? Living your life through somebody else's eyes. There's freedom in Jesus. Oh, listen, verse 4, he says, God puts you there. Listen, God puts you under the elements of the world to make you sick of it. You think of this. You know what it is? It's our job to preach the gospel and let the Holy Ghost do the work. I'm telling you this from experience. I've chased people. I've begged people. And I meant well doing it. And I don't mean that there's not a time to pursue people. But I've just, the Lord's just shown me this recently. If Jesus can't keep you, I'm never going to be able to keep you. And the Lord also showed me that I've been guilty of trying to make it easier for people than it really is. The way is straight and narrow. Jesus told a rich young ruler, sell it all and come follow me. That boy went away crying, but Jesus didn't go chase after him. A prodigal got his stuff and left, went to a far country and ended up broke wanting to eat the slop of the hogs. But that father wasn't sending $20 down there for lunch every day. He met him in the road on the way home, but he was on the way home. And sometimes we can get in the way of what God, sometimes they got to hit rock bottom. I had to hit rock bottom. And when I did, I'm not calling my daddy or my mama or my friend I ended up on my face, Brother Robert, calling on Jesus. And he met me, he saved me, he rescued me, and the best thing he ever did for me was make me feel guilty and dirty and lost. God puts you under the elements of the world. Be careful, man. Don't go around handing out money to people. We've given a fortune away. And there are times to do that. You understand? You know, people that are following the Lord and, you know, you're, you're in the house of God. And you, you're, you're, you're trying to do the, I give you the shirt off of my back. But I can tell you folks out there in the world, it's a reason they don't have a place to live or a car to drive or a job. And a little bit of money ain't going to help them. They got to find Jesus. And he'll get them a job and a place to stay. God puts you there to make you sick of it. Listen, verse 4, but when the fullness of time was come. The fullness of time means God's appointed time. God had a day picked out. God had a day prophesied. God had an appointed time. It's important for you to know God has an appointed time for your life. Don't, don't get ahead of him and try to open doors. I, I've, I've done that. You're going to wish you hadn't. I? Don't lag behind this little God just going to do it. No, just move with God. I think about this. Ezekiel saw ankle deep water, knee deep water, loin deep. Then before you know it, he's swimming in it. But if you're in ankle deep, pretending you're swimming ain't going to bring you there. Just walk where you are and keep following the man with the line in his hand. And he'll take you to deeper water. He'll take you to the promise. And there, God will get all the glory for it. God has an appointed time for our life. In this appointed time, God sent forth his son. God sent forth Christ. God had an appointed 
appointed day when that Holy Ghost would overshadow a virgin named Mary and Jesus would be born in a manger in Bethlehem. God has an appointed day when that trumpet's going to sound and He's going to stand on the clouds and receive us unto the air. The day is marked. God has another day prepared when He's going to split the eastern sky and a herd of white horses are going to come ride and, and bring redemption and righteousness to this world again. God has an appointed time for our life. God sent forth His Son. Listen to this. To redeem the... Listen, God sent forth His Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. It's important. God sent forth His Son. He didn't create His Son. <laughs> he simply sent His Son. Jesus always was, always is, always will be. The Alpha, the Omega, the early church, the gospel set forth the truth of the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wasn't just a baby born, God became a man. God, Emmanuel, God with us. You'll call his name Jesus and he will save his people from their sins. God had an appointed time. We were studying this today. Lauren had to help me with it. But this appointed time was so, so well. Uh, you know, it wasn't just an accident or God said, all right, I think we'll do it now. Point one, the law had done its work. Israel, this set apart, God called nation had tried for hundreds of years to keep the law and it brought them all to the same conclusion. We cannot do it. They were ready for a Messiah. They were ready for a Savior. Listen to this. The Greek language was spread all throughout the world at that time. It was one language spoken all over that region. So... The gospel message could be heralded to everybody. Listen, the Romans had come through and built roads all over the place. You could get to anywhere. Guess what went down those roads? Apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers. They're walking down those same roads that were built. God had an appointed time. Think about in our day, y'all. It's no accident. You have to know God has an appointed time for your life. You know, Paul was there. God had specifically, I believe in eternity past, God knew Saul would become Paul. And he's going to be the greatest propagator of the gospel message using those same roads, using it. Your life is no different for a time such as this. Yes. All that you've been through, all that you've walked through. Look at the day that we're in. You know, people can watch from anywhere, listen to the gospel on it, on it. Much as I hate them, phones, tablets, internet, it's available to all. God's going to use it for his kingdom and for his work. God sent forth his son. Listen, uh, he says, made of a woman. He's, he's got to be born of a woman because it has it was a man who fell it has to be a man who brings redemption also made under the law jesus lived his life under the law just like any other jewish man in that time the requirements were the same but the difference was all his life he walked and he kept the commandments of the Father in his mind, his heart, his soul, everything within him, totally obedient to the Father on our behalf. Listen, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. The word redeem actually means to be bought off of the slave market. God redeemed us from under the law, under its guilt, under its condemnation, under its death sentence. Paul is simply telling them, God has redeemed you from that. Stop living your life under a law mindset. Stop being that child who is heir to all things 
but you can't get to any of it. No, see, it's just I was thinking about the adoption of sons. God brought you into his family. I'm going to have to cut across the field and wind this up. But you belong in the family. You just think about it. If your kids are anything like mine at the house, and they go to open up a refrigerator, my dad said, Logan will rip the handle off a refrigerator. He don't ask nobody nothing. You know, he, he's just going. Not, is it okay if I get something out of the refrigerator? You sure? Y'all's kids do that? Maybe these well-behaved Woods kids do that. Man, not at mine. They just stand there like they're looking at a menu, you know, just waste $30 holding that refrigerator open. And they say if you're a, if you're a preacher's kid, it's not a matter of, of, when, of if but when you're going to be used in a sermon. But you know what? I'm glad they feel like that at my house. Lauren and I have asked the Lord, we want our home to be a happy place. Not where you can't wait till you're 18 to leave me in the dust, but you want to stay. You want to be there because it's a home filled with grace and love and where, you, where you belong. God brought you. God adopted you. The word adoption means to be brought out of one family into another. Listen to this. This is significant about adoption. In adoption, the child is chosen. I want you to be in my family. At birth, you didn't get to pick. You just got whatever. (laughs) Got whatever came out. (laughs) Y'all can laugh about that later. But in adoption, you're chosen. You ought to know I was chosen by the Lord. He said this to those disciples. You didn't choose me. I chose you. God chose you and he adopted you. He brought you in. Listen, adoption is a legal work. It means Satan lost all of his rights to you, to your life. You belong to God. God says, Hebrews 4, come boldly to the throne of grace. Just, just imagine if you have to, a kid opening up that refrigerator, looking, go in there. I'm not talking about arrogant or proud or not something like that, but like I belong here. Why? Because that is my father who's sitting upon that throne. He wants me to come. I'm not a child who's who's under tutors and governors. I become an heir with God and a joint heir with Christ. All the power of heaven, all of His strength, all of His grace, all of His love and His kindness and His mercy. Let that, don't, don't, don't just, you know, don't just know that, but not possess it, but walk in that. Let it be plugged. Don't just say, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I just feel, no, call on the Lord. God, I need you to help me. I need you to open a door and make a way for me. I need you to work a miracle in my life and walk in that because God brought you, redeemed you from under the law where it was your performance to a place of grace where it's his performance. God wants you to walk in that. He says this, he says, he sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That means my dear Father. One that I'm close to. One that I love. One that, you know, one that loves me. You know, one that would withhold nothing from me you know i want my boys to be proud that i'm their dad you know that's that's my daddy i want my wife to be proud that that's my husband can you uh, can, can you just know how the lord cares for his children how the lord cares about his name i, I don't believe it's god's will that we would be weak defeated overcome i don't believe it's god's will that you and i would live in poverty you know that we would just i believe god wants us to be a blessed people we are a highly favored people that we ought to walk different than this world walks why that spirit 
spirit cries from your heart, Abba, Father. The, the, that spirit cries out within you, that is my Father. When you get in trouble, don't say, I don't know what I'm going to do. Call on God and believe Him and walk. Don't let circumstances get the better of you. Man, I've run out of time here tonight. I want to encourage you. God adopted you into his family. You belong there. Walk like it. Believe like it. No. No, it's not. Well, all that's over there. I remember my grandmother had this nice room in her house, but none of us were allowed to go in there. It's just off limits. You know, don't even, don't even breathe when you walk by there. Some people have nice china in the cabinet. You can look at it, but you better not use it. I used to do stuff like that when I was a kid. I'd get in trouble for it. <laughs> I can tell you, nothing's off limits to you. The kingdom of God. The devil wants you to think that. The devil wants you to think it's all over there. God wants to make a difference now, here, in our life. And he wants us to know the power that's available to us. Would you stand here with me tonight? I just want to ask you for a moment, would you just lift your hands and say, thank you, Jesus, for adopting me. You know, he said that that child was under tutors and governors. It's because he can't make up his mind. He doesn't have the maturity to decide for himself. Listen, God says you have the mind of Christ. God says he's given you a new mind and a new heart inside of you. God wants you to be able to think like he thinks. God wants to put his word in your heart. God, God wants you to know all of that is available to you. When you have a bad thought, man, pull that down and say, God, I don't want to think like this. And because I've been adopted by you, I don't have to think like this. My mind doesn't have to be dark or perverted or twisted. Lord, my mind can be stayed upon you. My mind can be filled with peace when trouble comes. Man, I don't have to look around with this despair saying woe is me and nothing good ever but like Joshua if you need more time look at the sun and say stop stand still because it's the same God and that is available to you when the enemy comes rebuke him I don't belong to you I'm not in your family Jesus broke your chains off of my life and washed me in his precious blood and I've been delivered from your kingdom and translated into the kingdom of God's dear son I belong here I belong here oh God Many people feel like they don't belong. Even, you know, some leave church and you say, well, I didn't feel like they wanted me there. Can I tell you, you do belong. Yeah. Get to the altar. Yeah. Get to the presence of God. Move with Him. Don't be looking and see how, how's Carter going to treat me tonight. I'm not here for Carter. I'm here for Jesus. Yeah. And if I'm fellowshipping with Him, I can treat Carter good no matter how He right. treats me. Because I know what God has given me in Christ. Father, we thank you tonight for the adoption of sons. Oh God, we thank you, Lord. We do serve you. But Lord, we're not servants. We're sons. God, we thank you, Lord, that you've made us heirs with God and joint heirs with Christ. Lord, we thank you that you sent forth your spirit. Oh, that same spirit. Yes. Oh, that was crying out of Jesus as he walked this earth. Oh, that same, even that same spirit that prayed in the garden, my father, if it's possible, let the cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. That spirit who cried, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That same father. That same spirit has us crying out to you tonight, Father. Lord, I pray, let your church walk in this, Lord. Yes. Lord, let us truly possess it. Lord, let us truly walk in it. Oh, don't walk in the circles in the wilderness when God can enable you to cross the Jordan and possess the land. Oh, God, let us see this power. 
Lord, this strength, Lord, this blessing, this authority, this anointing, God, it's opened unto us and you want us to have it. God, we thank you that you don't lock your doors, but Lord, you, you promise to open the storehouses, open the windows of heaven and pour something out on us that we're not even ready to receive. Oh God, let us walk in a faith like that. Lord, instead of looking down in trouble, let us start looking up and coming boldly to that throne of grace instead of looking to the world for help with finances or whatever problems we're facing. Oh God, let us be reminded, quickened and encouraged. Come boldly to the throne of grace to find mercy and grace to help you in your time of need. Lord, we love you tonight. Bless each one's here. Bless them as they travel home. Father, we pray for good rest tonight. God, that we just wake up ready to walk with you, to be used by you in the morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Listen, there, there's a sign-up sheet for youth camp in the back. If you want to go ahead and sign it, let's plan on having a meeting at 4 o'clock Sunday about youth camp, if possible. If you can be here, if you have ideas or questions, be here.